really can't get my lighting how I like it today. I think it's because it's dark outside. I'm not happy. I hope it works out okay. Hello. Hi. Nice to see you. How are you? I know that this third lockdown for everyone that's in the UK has... It's kicked us all right in the gooch. <laughs> And I know that this one, lots and lots of people are struggling. So you know what? If your answer to how are you is, I am so shit, that's okay. It's okay to not be okay. Please just try and take care of yourself. We are all doing our best to get through. And I hope that maybe my, my little videos might just, just give you a little bit of, a little bit of light relief in, my goodness, such a, such a shitty time, right? So first off, thank you so much to everyone who has tuned in and watched my first video and subscribed uh, hundreds of views and it's a long video man thank you thank you so much i know i sound like i'm doing an acceptance speech now i need to be like i'd like to thank my mom and dad and god <laughs> but i just think it's really yeah i I genuinely have a lot of gratitude. It's made me really happy. Um, and I want to express that gratitude. So, so thank you. So yes, we're here for episode two and episode two today. We are talking about the iconic Stringfellows restaurant and strip club in London in Covent Garden. Um, so yeah, let's, let's just get straight into it. So Stringfellows was opened in 1980 by the late, great Mr. Peter Stringfellow. The word Stringfellows has been synonymous with class, sophistication, sexiness. And with the man himself, you know, the magazines always loved Mr. Stringfellow because he was sort of that, that Hugh Hefner character, wasn't he? You know, that, that real epitome of older, not, not considered so conventionally attractive man surrounded by these absolutely the most beautiful of the beautiful young women you know that are oozing glamour and style and sex appeal um, and he was he was a real caricature for the media you know they really enjoyed taking photos of peter you know when he was in his little speedos at the beach and he was wearing his leopard print and you know all that other kitsch stuff that was he was very well known for with his character peter was a really lovely man so Peter would come into the club quite regularly. He was really down to earth. Um, he would always pay lots of different girls to do dances. He recognised you if you were new. He would be very polite and it to you. And his wife was lovely as well. So I can remember Peter and his wife coming in. Um, and I can remember sitting on Peter's lap, chatting to him. And him, you know, handing me like 30 quid and being like, do a dance for my mate. Do a dance for my mate. And um, his, his wife was quite drunk and she was all giggly and she was just so lovely and she was like, oh, like, oh, the last time I was in, I got really drunk and fell over and showed my knickers to like, I need to like, try and have some decorum. <laughs> and I think every woman can fucking relate to that man having got drunk and fallen over and shown our knickers. Happens to the best. Um, but yeah, so lovely and so down to earth. And it always kind of annoyed me the way they caricatured Peter Stringfellow, like, so, early 2000s, I worked in Stringfellows 2004. It was the second club that I worked in. My first club was LA Confidential. And then I auditioned at both um, Stringfellows and Spearmint Rhinos and actually got into both and would chop and change which one that I worked. I'll come into the reasons for that in a little bit. Um, I think early 2000s, 90s, early 2000s, the era sort of started of radical feminism. I mean, obviously radical feminism had been around for a long time before that, but the anti-sex work ideas became a little bit more potent with lots of people starting to really hone in on the likes of Hooters and the likes of strip clubs and page three um, in the newspapers and started really questioning the objectification of women. Um, so I can understand there were people who had a problem with Peter Stringfellow because he was seen to profit off women's bodies um and so i get that side of it but really it was more like do you remember in heat magazine right and i don't know how old my audience so i'm sure a lot of you will have remember heat magazine and have seen it um when they used to do the circle of shame and like with the upskirting in my true crime tuesday video just dropping that in there as though i also do true crime tuesday my first video is out media misogyny and murder 
It's a very good video. We talk about upskirting, we talk about the predatory paparazzi, we talk about the media influence on how crimes are perceived and investigated, how victims are treated. We talk about the Yorkshire Ripper documentary on Netflix. It's, it's a good time. It's not. It's not a good time. It talks about really serious shit, but, but it's very interesting and entertaining. And I highly suggest if you've enjoyed these Stripper Sunday videos, you have a little slide over to my True Crown Tuesday uh, where we talk about a lot of those kind of narratives. Just doing a little bit of a shameless plug in there. Um, but yes, I talked about this in, in my True Crown Tuesday video, how the paparazzi um, really would used to upskirt celebrities and, and women out on nights out and at the races. It used to be so common in newspapers to see these pictures of women drunk on the floor and the photographers have literally angled their cameras up their skirt, how they'd used to be predatory and lie in wait. There was, you know, a graphic I put into my True Crime Tuesday video where you could actually see a photographer um, holding his arm out with the camera like, like this where Lady Gaga was working past. So she was dressed, you know, skirt almost to the knees and he's literally extending his arm out and extending that camera out and trying to get a shot of her skirt. Like, the paparazzi have been known for years to be shameless, predatory fuckers, okay? Going back to Heat Magazine, if you remember those circle of shame sections they used to do and they would be like stirking these celebrities, like just going to the beach with their families just just living their lives, just doing their own thing. And these these photographers would, would wait for them to bend over to pick their baby up or to see them lean forward, you know, to get the sun cream and so that their body may be curled and just showed a little a little a little roll, a little ripple, where they moved a certain way and you could see a bit of cellulite. Or, you know, maybe a little bit of bit of armpit bag. And and they would take these pictures and print them in this magazine with a big circle around it, the circle of shame, like, look, look, look at fucking Cameron Diaz with her cellulite, look at Gwyneth Paltrow with her single roll on her stomach, like, look at these fucking fat, unkempt bitches, like, how dare they exist in public, shame on you, shame on you. It's like that fucking gif, isn't it, with the bell, like, shame, shame. But they used to do this to Peter, okay? So, you know, Peter would just be on his yacht, <laughs> on his yacht, um, over at the beach, you know, out on holiday, and they just fucking, the music, the paparazzi just loved to, like, get pictures of him and shame him for having, like, a belly and for having a mullet and not being, like, conventionally attractive. Um, and it really was such bullshit. He was a nice guy, really nice guy, really down to earth. I'm not saying that he wasn't problematic in some ways, you know. I think anyone who is the proprietor of a business or a premises that profits off women's bodies, there's an element of, of problematicness there. But in general, compared to other strip club managers and other people, he was very nice, very down to earth. I liked Peter. You know, he was a wonderful businessman. His restaurant served steak to Princess Diana. You know, he met the Queen. He he was given awards. He but he was just constantly treated like like this caricature. So the girls that worked in Stringfellows were known as Stringfellows Angels. And there was a very high standard that you would expect it um to uphold if you worked in Stringfellows. It was not an easy club to get into. The night I auditioned for Stringfellows, I'd estimate there was about 12 to 15 girls who were auditioned. If I remember correctly, they did their auditions on a Saturday. Um, and that's because in London, it works very differently to the strip clubs in other parts of the country. So, for example, in Liverpool, when I was talking about Angels last week, um, our busiest nights were Friday, Saturday. They're the nights you want to work, the weekend nights where you've got all that trade coming over for the football matches, for stag dues, um, particularly that nightlife, weekend, boozy trends. In London, your main money was from businessmen, and it was from businessmen bringing their clients into the clubs to schmooze them. So Stringfellows had a restaurant and then when you went downstairs you had to buy an expensive bottle of wine or a bottle of champagne 
and that would take you downstairs. So we got lots and lots of clients who ran big businesses in the city who were bringing clients in, uh, generally international clients. We got lots of lots of men bringing in Asian clients and American clients because how's it easier to sell a contract? You having to sit and schmooze them and talk to them and charm them and entertain them? Ugh. Getting several beautiful women whose literal job it is is to be charming, be pleasing to the eye, make them feel good. What's more likely to get that customer to sign on that dotted line? And if you've had clients that were already signed up, when they came into and came into London and they flew in, they expected these companies to show them a good time. So these these businessmen would have company credit cards where a budget was literally allocated for these purposes for entertaining these clients, these shareholders. Um, so the money was there to literally be spent for that purpose. And boy, did they spend it. Fuck me. And also, of course, Stringfellows was very well known for getting a lot of celebrity clientele. So we all had to sign non-disclosure agreements when you started working in lots of these clubs. I remember signing one for Sophisticats. I'm damn sure I signed one for Stringfellows when I signed up. Damn sure. However, lots of girls, once they left the club, you can go online and find lots of ex stripper reveals or stories. I think a lot of girls did, you know, sell their stories. Um, but it was actually very frowned upon at the time. Even now, recording these videos, I'm quite reluctant to name names because it's just a, mm, why do celebrities not have the right to enjoy anonymity coming in and spending their money in a legal way? But. I might just drop some hints, drop some little hints as to who it might be, but not, I just feel really uncomfortable with it. It was just sort of always considered very poor practice. And at the end of the day, you were earning so much money working in these clubs that you didn't need to go and make a few grand selling out to the sun. Don't buy the sun. Don't buy the sun. Don't buy the sun. You know, why would you risk a, a club where you were making thousands and thousands of pounds? You know, I know that there was one story I seen online when I was um, Googling little pictures to put into this video um, and she had made like a quarter of a million pounds working in string fellows, like a quarter of a million pounds. So I know I spoke last week a little bit about the heyday of stripping and I definitely came in on the very last years of that heyday. I think by the time I, I started in string fellows, I'd missed it. Stringfellow's heyday was the 90s. That's where you made all that money. There was still money to be made, but it was very difficult because the competition was fierce. So, so yeah, because we got lots and lots of businessmen, generally it was the busy nights and the nights with the highest house fees in London were Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. They were the nights you wanted to work. That was where you got your big spenders in. Um, or with the company credit cards, because again, that's what that's what your BDIs were looking out for, for, for them company credit cards. So I, I seem to remember they did the auditions on a Saturday, with Saturday being one of the quiet nights. Now, in Stringfellows, on a Saturday night, they also used to have male strippers come in, but we'll talk about that a bit more later. So when I auditioned, there was only four of us out of the 12 to 15 that auditioned that got asked to to sign up and to do our contracts and, and they agreed to let work there. There was two twins. Obviously there's two of them, they're fucking twins. <laughs> um, and interestingly, Stringfellows had two pairs of twins that were working there, identical twins. Um, and that always fascinated me a little bit because I thought, how do you get to that point? How do you get from being twins growing up together to being like, let's take our clothes off together? But we know twins is a big fetish. It's a lot of men's fantasy. There's also a very clever sales tactic with twins as well. And again, I'm going to talk about that in a little bit. And one of the set of twins who worked in Stringfellows is in the Kevin and Perry Go Large movie. So there you go. A little bit of, a little bit of claim to fame there. Um, so when they were doing the auditions, they were definitely trying to look and see what fit the Stringfellows brand, but also what they already had on their books, who was already regularly on the floor. 
um, and they would select from that. So sometimes you just wouldn't get into a club because they were looking for more of a certain type of girl. They wanted some more curvy girls. They wanted some more black girls. They wanted a, a different, you know, look. They had enough of girls that sort of looked like you. They wanted more girls with big tits. They tried to, in the London clubs, have a diversity of, of body types, ethnicities, hair colour, body shapes. Um, actually, I thought it was quite diverse. Um, string fellows, not so much in a lot of ways. Um, there was a, a newspaper story where they sacked a girl until she lost weight. They suspended her until she lost weight. And that wasn't uncommon. But in a lot of the other clubs in London that I worked in, you know, thinking in my head, it was very diverse what you saw on the floor. But string fellows had very exacting standards. So they would only have plus size if it was like acceptable plus size you know big tits and a big bum and um, they yeah if, if you put on too much weight they'd suspend you until you lost <laughs> fucking hell it's bad isn't it so again i can see when we have certain conversations about people who really like just like peter stringfellow it's the stuff like this but it was very difficult to get in they didn't take many people on and there were very strict rules about presentation. So as I've just said, if you were considered to have put too much weight on suspenders until you until you become an acceptable body shape for that club. Fucking hell. But string fellows also had hair stylists and makeup artists working in the dressing room. Okay? So if you came in and they didn't think that you looked presentable enough if they didn't think your hair looked good enough or your makeup looked good enough they would tell you to go and have your hair and makeup done or if you were just feeling a bit lazy or you wanted something a bit different um you could just pay to have your hair and makeup done but if you weren't presented in the way that they felt was acceptable you would be asked to go and pay the hairdresser or the makeup artist to, to fix you up like a lot of London clubs, string fellows had a long dresses before midnight rule. So you were expected to, to wear a long dress up until midnight. You were expected to wear jewellery. And string fellows had a strict no bag policy. You were not allowed to carry a bag with you onto the floor. Now, at this time, mobile phone cameras were just starting to come in. Um, and obviously, London has a big party scene. So I think a lot of that was for the anonymity purposes. They didn't want people bringing mobile phones onto the floor and trying to snap photographs of who was in the club um, or even little cameras, you know, trying to snap pictures if there were celebrities in or whatever. But also to try and discourage girls from, from carrying drugs with them. There was a big, big party culture in London at this time. Everywhere you looked, there was cocaine everywhere that you looked it was fucking nose candy everywhere you couldn't escape it so i think a lot of that was to keep the girls clean presented now you had to wear a garter so i'm linking a little picture onto this that i took off google before and um, where you'll be able to have a little look and you'll be able to see all the girls i think this picture was from peter stringfellow's 60th birthday party if i remember yeah he's got the little cake there hasn't he and um, that was from peter stringfellow's 60th birthday party um, and you can see all the girls there with their garters on and you had to wear it on your thigh. So there were other clubs where you had to wear a garter um, or you could choose to, to wear a garter. But you could be quite creative with how you wore it. Um, I will do a little video at some point for another club where to show you um, my little ankle cross garter trick, which is how I used to keep my stripper shoes on um, when you didn't have as much choice over what you were buying and generally if you wanted the really clear mules they didn't come with ankle straps so I used to use the garters to one hold my money and secondly keep them shoes on my feet I did have an incident in one club where a shoe flew off when I were on stage and whacked a customer like smack bang in the chest <laughs> um, he wasn't best pleased he did give me my shoe back though that was nice of him but in string fellows, very like with angels, um, if the customers paid on credit card, which let's face it, unless they were just doing £20 dances, most of them were going to be paying on their credit card. They paid you in string fellows dollars, in string fellows money. Um, I have got a picture of string fellows money. I found this on the internet because someone is actually selling it on eBay. 
I was tempted to buy it probably if it wasn't COVID and I actually, you know, had a job and an income and shit. I would have actually bought it so I could have shown it to you. Um, but instead, you're just getting a picture because I can't be fucking around with spending 20 quid on an old string fellow's notes like during COVID, all right? <laughs> um, so this in the listing on eBay, the gentleman says was handed to him, was issued in February 2006. So yeah, this note would have been the exact type of string fellows note that I would have been paid in when I worked there. How fun is that? Isn't that sweet? Gave me a little thrill of nostalgia. But these were designed to feel very much like money and they were designed to go on your garter. So you would loop your £20 notes and your dollars over your garter and you would just put a neat little elastic band around the money to keep it in place. They would sell garters in the dressing room. There would be bunches of them, all different styles, all different colours, to make sure, you know, that if girls came in to work their first night and, you know, they'd forgotten or didn't have one, you could easily get one. Now, remember me talking last week about the inaccessibility of accessing clothes for strippers and about how it was a very niche thing, you know, no internet. You had to go trailing to find the shoes and the outfits. In Stringfellows, we used to have a lady who would come in and she would bring a dress rail and she'd bring a selection of shoes and, and things like that. So you could particularly purchase the long dresses, but you could purchase shirt outfits as well. I seem to remember that one of the rules of Stringfellows after midnight when you were wearing your shirt outfit was that you had to have your bum covered. So you couldn't just wear a thong. Whereas in Angels, you could have your bum out, you could just wear a thong and, you know, suspenders. You had to have your bum covered. So I don't remember as many, unless it was a special night, I think, on the fantasy nights. If they had, like, a special costume night, it wasn't as strict. But on the general nights after midnight, you were still expected to present yourself quite classy, leaving a little something to the imagination. So I don't remember as many people wearing like lingerie sets. It tends to be more things like mini skirt and boob tube sets or, you know, like a mini skirt and bikini set. Or even like I had dresses that were the same brand um, as my long dresses, but they were just shirt versions. So... Oh La La was the big stripper brand in London. You went to any London strip club and everyone was wearing Oh La La. It was a uh, company that was based in Camden. You would go to their house to get your Oh La La stuff, but you had to procure their phone number in order to be able to go to the house. So at this point, I think I'd only been stripping about maybe six, seven months, maybe seven months. So I, I didn't know that yet really know that yeah I hadn't been put in the know so generally when I was buying costumes it was either stuff that I was literally getting from high street shops and making do with or I was buying secondhand outfits off the other girls or I was relying on these salespeople who appeared in the club would come in the club and have a rail so every club you went into people were wearing oh la la oh la la was a lot of outfits that were made out of lycra or maybe out of like almost netting, like netting material, very like see-through and um, like royally type material and very clingy and very soft. And they were adorned with sequins, okay? So like you'd go into clubs and there would be all oh, this beautiful shiny lycra in all oh, different colours. Um, all oh, this royal in different colours. They had big poofy flowers on them. They had ruffers and rippers. They had, I think in one of the pictures I got off Google, there's a girl who's wearing what looks very like an Ola La dress. Um, and it's got that big ruffle down the front. Um, I can remember having one Ola La dress that was strapless white, like netting material, that was like a fishtail skirt with all ripply ruffles down the front of the skirt and then all sequins across the boobs and it was just divine, just gorgeous. And they would very often as well come with like the fingerless gloves, you know, where they do the triangle here and come up to, to the elbow. So you'd have all these matching pieces. So I had some shirt dress. I remember having this beautiful pale pink shirt dress. The makeup I'm doing today is I had a long pink dress that I still have. It is hung up upstairs, ready for me to put on in a little bit. And I had a shirt pale pink dress and that one went round the back of my neck like this and then it had a little like bra, one of those things like a, a 
but you curl them like the hook and eye, like a bra hook and eye, just here. So you could either wear it like open or you could do the hook and eye like this. So it went there and then went like this and just showed your belly button. Or you could actually cross it. And I used to crisscross it and it had earl sequins down the front here and a little shirt skirt with earl sequins around the bottom. And it was so beautiful. They were like hand-sewn sequins. They were so beautifully made, these Ola Lar dresses. Um, so this makeup I'm doing today is actually a copy of one of the makeups I remember the makeup artist doing on me in String Fellows when I couldn't be asked to do my own makeup one night because I used to love wearing these pale pink dresses. So when I was dancing in um, String Fellows, my stage name was Satine, okay, Satine, um, because I felt like I wanted to, you know, put myself out there as, as very glamorous, kind of cutesy, but glamorous. And of course, Moulin Rouge was a big film around that time. So yeah, I really fancied myself as like this glamorous creature of the night. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So yeah, you would be able to access the, these these beautiful Ola Lar dresses. You'd be able to buy shoes. You'd be able to buy garters. So it was very convenient, actually. It was you know, especially in that time before the internet, it was it was very nifty to be able to have access to buying um those those items in the club. So let's talk about the club layout and the financials and that side of things, okay? So when you worked into String Fellows, you had to pay, I, I think I remember it being £20 entrance fee just to work through the dirt. When you looked to your right, there was a massive bar and it was a real, like, classy, glamorous bar. There was like a little presence and then just immediately to your left, there was a raised stage. So it was almost like the girls were dancing on a bar, but um, it was just, just the other side of the bar between the restaurants that was there and then where the bar was here. Then the restaurant was to the far left. It's not like when you hear them talk about strip clubs in America, about the buffets and it's like, don't eat the fucking buffet. This was a quality restaurant. As I said before, they had served steak to Princess Diana in this fucking restaurant. So that steak is still an iconic part of the String Fellows restaurant menu. So this food was expensive. I want to say it was like fine dining, but to be fair, like to me, it looked like fine dining because I was 18 years old and, you know, I come from fucking Merseyside. Like, you know, I were, I were one of them kids that came into stripping dead young. Like literally I was filming since I'd been 18, January 2004, I started stripping. Um, you know, I, I'd never had nothing. I'd, I'd never had nothing. I was one of them kids that came from a family situation of diverse parents that hated each other and wouldn't even speak to each other. Like me and my brother used to have to pass notes from my mum to my dad because she wouldn't even speak to him. And then they both had a new relationship. They were just having new kids, just having like new babies and they had their proper marriages now. So like me and my brother were just sort of unhappy attachments from their marriage that was an inconvenience to them really, that they didn't really still want to have. So when it came to us needing anything or things needing to be paid for, it was always war over who were going to pay for it. You know, it was always like, ask your dad and then dad being like, well, I've got no money, but then having a fucking holiday to Egypt and a holiday to Florida and buying a house and all of that, you know, it was like, I've got money, but not for you because... But they just, they never should have had kids. They had kids dead young. They never should have had kids. And then when they divorced and were left with these kids and both just never wanted to see each other again, if they were just counting down till we were 18 and they could basically like fuck us off and live their lives. So when you grow up in that family situation, you're never hurt that you're worth anything. No one wants to pay for you. No one wants to spoil you. No one sees you as precious. So when I started working in the likes of String Fellows, um, people were giving me money just to talk to me and I'm telling me I, I was amazing and special and beautiful, getting given a job in this prestigious, like legendary, iconic club for beautiful women, being told like that we were, we were special. I'd never had that in my life, mate. I'd never had that in my life. So like having money in my hands and being in that club, it, it was just a very severe experience. I think I actually struggled when I first started stripping in London with getting the sit downs and selling the champagne rooms because to me, 500 pound for them to like buy a bottle of champagne and pay for an hour of my time seemed like such a lot of money, such a lot of money. To them, it 
it was really fuck her. Do you know what I mean? It was like us lashing a tenner, you know, to... Yeah, just, just a different world, in it? But, so, I think to me, when I looked at this restaurant and seeing this food, it was just like, oh my God, this is so fancy. But, I mean, I didn't have KFC till I was 19. What the fuck do I know? Like, <laughs> like you know, shit. Can't trust me. So, to go downstairs, the customers then had to pay for um, a bottle of, a really fancy bottle of wine or a bottle of champagne off a particular menu. And then when you went downstairs, there was a three pole stage. The stage was almost like a, a kind of T-shape with lots of nice fancy chairs around it. Um, and then there were VIP booths around the outside as well. And there was actually another pole that was sort of by the VIP rooms as well. So when they were calling you onto the stage to do your stage shows during the night, when the DJ was calling you out, Fuck now, you had to listen to them instructions because it'd be like, you know, let's have Emma and Anna to pole one and pole two. So it'd be like Emma and Anna stand by for pole one, pole two. Roxy stand by for pole three. You know, Satine stand by for pole four. And so you'd have to listen to which pole you were on <laughs> and standing by for it. So the three stage, if I remember, you had to stay on that for three songs. So you'd go to one pole, walk across to that pole and then walk to the front pole. So only one person would be being heard because when the person finished on the front pole, they'd step off. So there was always someone replacing on pole three. So it would go round and round and round and round. Now, them poles on that T stage were shirt, shirt. Like you could only just invert without kicking the ceiling they were very very short and um, so you weren't doing much on them it was very much the the idea of performing in string fellows was more just just moving around posing being very cheeky very elegant making eyes with the clients smiling you know it was uh, very and you've got to think if you're in your long dresses as well like what the fuck are you doing on a pole when you've got a skirt down to your ankles so you know it was just all about elegance all about glamour um, creating that image. Now sit downs, if, if the guys wanted to, you know, keep your company, first of all, we would get paid to eat a meal in the restaurant. <laughs> we would get paid £250 an hour to have dinner paid for for us and to sit and eat in the restaurant with these, with these clients. I've got a picture that I'll, I'll put up and I, I'm sure the girls and it's you know it's they could potentially be the guys girlfriends but looking at the way they're dressed I'm pretty sure they're dancers um and yeah you would be paid 250 pounds an hour to sit and eat this amazing food I can remember the first time um, and so again being on that bar pole the two poles between the bar and the restaurant were great that were brilliant because if you were on there and guys were in the, you know coming in to have dinner and they wanted some girls to entertain the clients like they don't fucking want to talk to them anymore they want some pretty girls to schmooze them and you're on that pole they just look up and go yeah i'll have her have her that one over there uh, pick one for me that's got nice big boobs will you charlie over here like so big pretty girly <laughs> so yeah 250 pounds an hour so then when you were downstairs you could do Dances were twenty pounds, and you could do champagne rooms or VIP sit downs for two hundred and fifty pounds an hour. Okay, so if you had regular customers coming in that liked you, uh, if your pasta was good, you could make a lot of money. Now, I never did particularly well in string fellows. I'm not going to sit here and bullshit you and tell you I was walking out that club with grands. That wasn't a money club for me. Hence why I only worked there for a couple of months. Um, I did better in Spearmint Rhino, and actually, eventually, I moved over to Metropolis. Um, and then Sophisticats, because for me, I made far more money in them clubs. String fellows was would have Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, if they were busy, like anticipated to be busy nights, they'd have 80 to 100 girls working the floor. A hundred girls. I can remember one night sitting in there, I think it was a Thursday night. Now, you had to pay as you entered the building to work. Um... And the fee was a sliding fee, depending on what night it was. So, like, Saturdays would be cheaper because Saturdays were shit. So, you only paid maybe, like, 30 quid for a Saturday. But Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, it was £80 to work. Plus £5 for the house mum. That was your tip out for the house mum. I don't really remember the house mum doing anything, to be honest. <laughs> I don't even really remember who the house mum was, whereas I do in other clubs. So, don't know where that five were going. So, before you had made a single bean you were £85 down. And no matter what happened that night, you were £85 down. I can remember one night sitting in that club, all night, 
waiting for customers to come in and it was dead. There was a hundred girls working and we must have had maybe 20 customers in all night. Um, and it was just bedlam because people were getting like desperate and starting to like try and like literally fight each other. The rule was that you couldn't go and approach a customer until they'd sat down and they had a drink in the hand, okay? So when they came in and like the waitress would take their order and go away to get their drinks, you would see the girls starting to hover, hover, like literally, like like vultures waiting for a, a creature to die. And then as soon as those drinks hit the table, they would swoop in and they would literally sit themselves on these guys' laps. I can remember one night in there sitting on the chair next to a guy talking to him and a girl came and sat on the customer's lap with her back to me. Literally while I was there talking to him, she literally sat on his lap and stuck it back to me so that she could get in. And the guy was like, excuse me, like trying to look around her. And she was like, no, look at me, look at me. Um, crazy. That is how cutthroat it could get on nights like that. It was bad. Um, so I can remember everyone just sat there like, waiting to see if we were going to actually go home with anything i think it's wrong i don't think you should ever have that situation in a club this is where i much preferred the clubs that sort of worked on that sliding scale of like what you earned on top of those fees right when the guys paid on their credit card they had to pay an extra 20 percent so if they were spending 20 pounds to pay for a dance it would cost them 22 pounds and you'd only get 18 and you would have to wait normally three days to get your money. So you'd hand all your dollars in at the end of the night. And then you go home. So if you'd only been paid in credit card dollars, you were going home with no money. Till a few days later when you went in and they had the, the envelope ready for you, which you're cashing it. They weren't cashing out that cash on the night. It was days later. Um, so again, hmm, not ideal. So it was a very competitive club now. This is where the twins did very well, the two sets of twins, because I think I struggled in string fellows because in most of the clubs I worked in, um, I managed to make friends, you know, and normally you'd have someone that you were very close to and the two of you would tag team up. So you'd work as a pair and that was great because say there was a couple, say there was four of you that got on well, but you worked in two pairs and then a fur came in. You get in there and you're all together and it works well because even if you swoop on a guy, <laughs> swoop in there, that's one of the fur and he don't really like you, but he likes your mate who's got dark hair and big boobies, the Merlites will first still go in the VIP because you can all move round and all dance for each other. So even if he's like, well, Misty's her, right, but I prefer her over there. I prefer a mate. It's cool because you're getting both of you. And I think working in that strategy is is very good for especially for like champagne sales clubs uh, where you're trying to get the business money it works very well i really struggled to make any friends in string fellows i didn't every other club i, I had friends and people i work with string fellows i found it really difficult and um, i was very on my own so it was much harder for me to make money because say you know people don't tend to really come in on their own as much and um, if a group of four are coming in and two pairs swoop in you're on the outskirts so i was always sort of like waiting for the single guys to come in and don't get me wrong it plays in my favor a few times because then i'd be able to go and swoop in on a guy that was on his own and, and do well out of him but i just didn't make the money in string fellows i think because it was so expensive as well and this is where it comes down to as well certain clubs will suit you it's horses for curses it's never going to be a one size fits all for these clubs. There's no sort of right or wrong with it. Everyone will have slightly different opinions. Um, and these are just mine, just mine. But um, even though I didn't do as well there and didn't make as much money, I absolutely loved the experience and I'm glad to say that I worked there. I feel very fortunate to have done that, you know. If you've ever read any of my writing, um, if you've got me on, on social media and, you know, you know, I used to have my blog, Political Pole Dancer, um, I talk a lot about about the midnight hours. I talk about that time in the small hours of the morning because that always really speaks to me. And I think it comes from, from working in string fellows. That's where it originally came from. And I can remember getting a taxi back from from working in string fellows um, all the way back to where I was living, which was near Putney. And so the taxi driver took me past Buckingham Palace and past like 
the Houses of Parliament and Big Ben and I'm just sat in a taxi, beautiful glitter, big hair, you know, haven't finished work. I think I've done quite well that night as well. And I'm just looking, this is my taxi ride home, this is my taxi ride home from work and it was like that wee small hours in the morning. There's a time, right? There's a time at about four o'clock in the morning where it's like the whole world inhales and it just holds its breath. The exhale comes at about 6am when things start bustling, the milkman's out, people get up for work, but just, just for that little moment in time, the whole world is holding its breath. And there's a few other times I can think of when that's really spoken to me. One of the other times, and I'm sure anyone who's had, had a baby will relate to this, is when you're up doing a feed at like 4am. And I had one of them rocking chairs, you know, to feeding chairs. And I can remember sitting and looking out the window with the flat hat at the time, giving my son a feed and gosh, the world's just still no one there it's not sound it's just it is like the whole world just 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 holding its breath for that moment and taking that ride in a taxi london could still be busy at them times but this particular night early hours of the morning and looking at these monuments, looking at Buckingham Palace and these amazing iconic landmarks that people pay thousands and thousands of pounds to fly over to the UK and see. And just having this moment of thinking, wow. And as I said before to you, you know, for, for me being so young and sort of having a bit of a, a shitty um, childhood and teen years, my goodness to me, it was like, at that moment, I had the whole world in the palm of my hands. I got a little bit deep and poetic there for a second, didn't it? So, you know, I know I mentioned last week, um, talking about angels, that I definitely wish I'd been a bit more sensible um, with my money when I was dancing and actually, like, saved it. Um, but continuing on from what we're just saying, um, for me, yeah, this was really the first time I'd had money in my hands, like... So, like, you take a kid who's never really had much and is 18 and is suddenly getting a bit of money dropped in their hands, and my goodness, like... <sighs> I remember um, going into Selfridges and just buying, like, five, six hundred pounds of MAC brushes, being like, yeah, I'll have that one, I'll have that one, I'll have that one. Yeah, 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 cool, 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 that's fine, that's fine. Going to, like, MAC, Dior, all the sort of big makeup names at the time and just being like yeah i love that yeah i love that yeah i love that you know i remember buying um half head wigs became really popular and um, with the london dancers so i can remember like buying a half head wig that you'd then like back home your natural hair and like bring it over the top of um and wearing one of those um, and again, like, I, went, I remember going to Selfridges to get that because, as I said last week, a lot of beauty products weren't as accessible as they are these days. Yeah, and this half wig was, like, so ridiculous, like, £250, like, okay. Crazy. Now, again, the one last really interesting point I have to make about Stringfellows, as I mentioned before, is that... We hosted male strippers on a Saturday night. So on a Saturday, it was a far more relaxed club. Um, there wasn't like the same strict rules about having to buy champagne or expensive wine to go downstairs, if I remember correctly, because they had the male strippers downstairs. So they were encouraging, you know, women down to come and have dances. Um, they were lovely, really, really nice. The guys, the, the male strippers were really lovely, but it was very strange sort of work. Normally I've worked a club where like, upstairs it was the the female dancers and i hate using that word female and um, but yeah the the women dancers and downstairs it was there were male dancers but working sort of on the same floor was a bit strange and there was never really much money to be made in string fellows on a saturday night you could get lucky maybe but there wasn't an awful lot of money to be made. So that was the reason that I auditioned for Stringfellows and Spearmint Rhinos at the same time, so that I had an option of another club to go and work in. Um, and I would generally split myself over the two clubs, like different nights each week, do a couple of nights in each. One thing I will say for having worked alongside male dancers is that I was shocked with how poorly the women clientele treated the guys. Um, they were very grabby. 
okay um, and i've seen this um in other areas of performance as well i've got a, a a friend who's a michael jackson impersonator and he's been like accosted even when he was only like 17 16 17 he would get accosted by like 60 70 year old women like really old women um and women seem to be a lot braver in getting a bit grabby with male performers and yeah, I, I don't know whether it's because male nudity isn't as sacred as female nudity because it hasn't been held to the same standards as shame and modesty culture, that it's not quite seen as, as special and fragile and precious. It's not quite as revered. Because generally, at this point in time, when guys came into Stringfellows and, and those kind of clubs in London, and even Angels, as I said last week, we were really revered. Like, there's a reason we were called Stringfellows Angels. We were seen as these like heavenly beings and um, this was before the turning culture. I do really want to talk about this turning culture that happened while I was dancing and that's sort of switch from us being really like quite revered and like stripping and giving a lap dance being seen as something quite special to where it really changed and it was with the onset of like online porn, accessibility of mobile phones but I'm gonna go into that more I think in in next week's video um i think i might do platinum lounge in chester next week but that's a really interesting one because there's so much that goes with that because there was the radical feminist um bid to have the club shut down that was successful and the club actually got closed because of um a radical feminist woman's swerve campaign like saying that it was wrong and immoral and um, even though the girls actually marched against her and was like we're fine we want to do this you're taking away our livelihoods and the club very sadly got closed down and um, but there's a huge interesting story there with platinum launch i think i might do that one next week um but yeah that you know it was that last bit of, of era really where we really were revered and, and looked at with with so much awe. um and just for that experience i think i'm grateful to have had the opportunity to work in string fellows um yeah and I just think it's a real shame that historical and cultural narratives have meant that men's bodies aren't revered in the same sort of way. Men should get to be sensual and treated like they're amazing heavenly beings too. It'd be nice if we could sort of find that middle ground between women being really subjugated due to that objectification and sexualizing that's gone on for years and then men's bodies sort of just being treated like, well, what do you matter? You just go and fuck anything that works anyway. Like, why would I revere you? And we found this middle ground for every gender, all of the genders, every single one trying not to be cease normative I don't mean to be but just talking about those those very overt stereotypes they do tend to be very cease normative they do tend to be in that binary which is just bullshit but yeah if we could find this lovely happy middle place where everyone respected each other's bodies and celebrated them but without abusing them be real and fucking nice that wouldn't it so I'm just gonna go and finish getting ready I know I haven't actually like <laughs> got a wiggle on with doing my full face as much this week I'm really sorry I was getting turking and going down memory lane more than I was applying but I'm just gonna go and do my last few bits and pieces I'm gonna get my dress on and I'm gonna come back transformed into a Stringfellows angel <laughs> Stringfellow circa 2004 look and um, my Olala dress. I remember wearing this little pink diamante heart necklace and like really loving it with this dress and my little shirt pink Olala dress because it was like it was like the Titanic necklace you know but pink and it was like but I thought the old lady dropped it into the ocean in the end. Well baby I went down and got it for you. Ah uh, you shouldn't have. So I think I've definitely got like some Britney vibes going on. Yeah, you can you can see, can't you, the hangover from the 90s as well, like that 90s stripper glamour sort of just moving over still into the early 2000s. And um, you know, the looks are still a little bit more natural, aren't they? You know, it's not lots of false eyelashes, really heavy makeup, hair extensions. It's still quite like fluffy natural hair. Sometimes so with this look, I'd have like, oh, this bit up here had it floofed up. 
like this and then had my half wig so where you've got these lovely light waves the half wig would have then come down and just made another two of them so yeah there would have just been a bit more but still again it was a very like big natural glamour you know false eyelashes I don't really remember anyone really wearing false eyelashes around that time period the false eyelashes kind of being common and wearing them for you know every shift came later it was far more common to see us all like stacking, 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 stacking the mascara on and um, to build up our lashes. That Maybelline mascara was really popular at the time with the, the white, where you put the white on first and then layered it in the black and you could make like this really big like eyelashes effect. But um, yeah, you know what? I'm not even mad about this look. I'm, I am not at all mad about this look. Like this is cute as fuck, man. This is cute as fuck. This is like baby pink jessica rabbit vibes this is like barbie glamour like i think i've just taken about five years off myself to be honest maybe i should wear this look more often and um, yeah i'm loving it it's adorable and it's so nice to this dress would have been burnt around 2004 so this dress is is as old as my pole dance career <laughs> 17 years old and um, i still have it yeah look how beautifully they fit man the sparkle the shine so well made and really like glamorous as well. I think very different image to what people imagine when you say I used to be a stripper. You know, we were talking last week about the American centric ideas and culture and I still think people are imagining, you know, you being in these little strappy outfits, you know, twerking on a stage and smashing your heels down and having dollars thrown at you. And it's just, just so different to that. Just so different actually what my experience of working in a lot of clubs was like and i think people certainly don't envision this you know the skin tight lycra the pinks the sequins the glitter it's just not what people are seeing in their head and then yeah i've got my string fellows garter i know this one's kind of the wrong color for the dress but it was the only one i had to hand um i have got lots of garters tucked away somewhere in one of my many massive tupperware boxes full of costume pieces and stuff and um, but this one was the only one to hand but yeah it very iconic for, for string fellows. You weren't working in string fellows unless you had a thigh garter. So yeah, this is this is my string fellows circa 2004 look. Um, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. I'm sorry that not as much makeup went on. I, I started talking a lot instead. Um, what I might do is in the description boxes just write you know, the different products that I use and have used. So that um, yeah, if you're looking at anything and thinking, oh, I like that. That's nice. Um, yeah. You can you can have a look and yeah see see what see what's gone on my face especially the stuff that's happened off camera I really do have to do that liquid eyeliner off camera but it's too difficult to do while twerking and again you know we've still got the skinny eyebrows we've got the quite high arches you know again that Jessica Rabbit arch so it's the big lips lots of lip gloss the Jessica Rabbit arch. And I'm ready to go and make some money. So thank you so much for joining me today. I really hope you enjoyed this video and it's brightened and sparkled up your Sunday a little bit. Please do join me for True Crime Tuesdays um, and also for my fuming Fridays where I just talk about the stuff that's been, it's been pissing me off that I've been fuming about, that's been weighing heavy on my mind that I've been thinking about and I just wanna let it out there. A lot of what I talk about relates back to social psychology, to societal phenomenons, to, to criminology, to societal cultural trends um, and how they impact how we treat other people, how we're treated um, and our experiences of life. So please do subscribe, follow me on Instagram, I am Misty Pole Dancer and I'm here for you every Sunday and every Tuesday as well and some Fridays. Depending on how fuming I've been that week. Thank you so, so much for your time and attention. Please stay safe, stay at home, wash your hands, and I will see you again later!